being obsessed about learning more and new techniques, especially those quote unquote advanced techniques, would, would you say that's a path astray, which blocks the person? It's more of learning? a phase. So, you know, in the beginning, if you're a white belt in jujitsu, you might be struggling and getting beaten by a peer, and then the coach can show you a movement that will allow you to escape or finish or whatever it is, and instantly it makes a difference in your game, and, and you start equating accumulation to performance, which it is at that stage. And this, this is especially true around blue belt level, where they're acquiring more movements and more attacks. They, they have enough of the fundamentals to be able to play positionally, but they get more movements and attacks, and each time they get a movement, it kind of gives them an edge on their other fellow blue belt and they really start to get into this accumulation phase. They go on YouTube and they start looking for all kinds of new stuff that the other guy doesn't know yet. Mm -hmm. But eventually, by the time you get around to, you know, brown belt level, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to beat the other brown belt, especially if you roll with them or her on a regular basis and it's not a one-off. You're not going to beat them because you catch them with something they haven't seen before. I mean, it can happen, but it's rare mm -hmm. because fundamentally, it, Positionally, they're going to be so good that you're going to have to pass their guard or, or be able to escape. You're going to have to be able to, do, to dominate in some way positionally to be able to finish them. And that's when you start to realize, oh, this is where I, you know, you can have two submissions in jiu-jitsu and, and be a threat to anyone. But you have to go back and, and rework the positional fundamentals that we, that we all learn at day one, you know, how you're, how you're shrimping and how you're moving your body, how you're connected to your opponent, your ability to, to feel their pressure, where you put your weight, um, all that stuff becomes so much more important than, than the new. Hello, martial arts men and women. So today I consider to have a very special talk and it's not the first time I talk with the coach, Professor Matt Thornton, but at the same time, it's the first time we're really sitting down in front of each other. So it was such a blast. It was, it was very surreal just to, we connected up a couple of times during the last six or seven months through internet. And he, uh, Matt really touched me with what he had to say and, and had a big impression from him and a very good impression. And it just was so nice to sit down with him and, and talk to him. And actually what's interesting is that this brings me to a story that I wanted to share with you guys and girls for a while, uh, but I never did. I just didn't find this the right circumstances. So uh, a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, I decided to give myself a challenge and I decided to take a walk of uh, 250 kilometers. So that's like 200 miles. And I decided to cover it in, I think it was like five days. And so I walked like from early morning to late evening from my city to the capital of my country, Lithuania. So it was a lot of walking <laughs> and partly by my own, but sometimes I was joined by other people. And one of those days I was, uh, I was joined by a professional photographer, really cool guy. We knew each other a little bit from before, but, but then we had a lot of time, you know, just walking through forests and paths and uh, streets and, uh, and uh, actually train rails. We walk like a lot of time on the train rails. And eventually, but the, the point is, let me get, get back to my story. Uh, the point is that uh, obviously we, we talked a lot about a lot of things and he's a smart guy, so we talked about smart things. And uh, I, one moment I asked him a question. I asked, so, because he was talking a lot about expertise and, and, and being really great and he's that he's looking up to other people and I was like I asked him so, so who are who are they who are you looking up to who's inspiring you to become better in your field like in photography and he thought for a moment he said it's just too many people he was like just at awe at so many great photographers that inspired him and that made him want to become better and that he just like felt they're so way ahead of him and oftentimes you know when you ask a question some person you kind of set the question up back for yourself you're like, if you really want to tell about the movie you watched last, you're like, hey, what's the last nice movie you watched? And then you wait for that answer, for the same question back. Uh, that was not a setup for me. I was just, I sincerely just asked him that question and I did not see him asking me back. And, but he did. He's like, so he's, he's like, what about you? And back then I was still having my dojo. I was still actively being an Aikido instructor. And he's asked, so who does inspire you in Aikido? Who are you looking up to in Aikido? And I started thinking and I dropped into this kind of flat line. I was like, 
just couldn't find an answer. And for a while I was thinking and thinking and I suddenly came to this kind of terrible, uh, kind of awful realization that there was no one in Aikido that inspired me, inspired me anymore. Yes, there used to be back in the day. I was like, oh, my sensei, my instructor, like Christine Tissier or some other guys I was watching. I was like, wow. But that day after doing Aikido for like 14 years and uh, slowly already becoming disillusioned, I was like, there's no one, no Japanese high ranking sensei. No one inspired me anymore. It's just like, I didn't see anything which was way, of course, and, and the thing is, of course I wasn't the best. It's like, of course I was just like, you know, I was good enough to run a dojo. I devoted many years to it, but I wasn't incredible. I mean, there were, there are definitely masters much better than me. And, and I still uh, respect, like, for example, Christian Tissier or some Japanese senses or whatever. But, but they're not like, oh my God, I'd like to be like him or like them. And, and, every, and, and but that was, as I said, that was a shocking moment because I realized it's a crisis. It's a bad situation that I'm in a field where I don't feel that I have anywhere else to push for, anywhere else to go for. There's no one inspiring me and showing me like a, like a guideline, like a, like a lighthouse showing where I could move towards to. And that was such an essential part for me for so many years in my youth, in my earlier years, when I was like, just had so many people around me or, or just like, Mm, I read about so many people. I was like, oh, man, they inspire me to become better. I want to become more like them. And I realized that day I did I had no one. No one. And uh, that was a crisis. And I think that turned a big cog in my head, which said, man, there's something really wrong with your Aikido situation right now. And I think that question might have very well started the process, part of the process which I'm in now, dropping Aikido and wanting to become a student again. Now, how does that relate to Matt, <laughs> to Matt Thornton? And I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time here, but you feel free to skip to the interview if, you, if you're bored up with this, but just a few more minutes. Uh, so I walked you know, it's all the way to that city and I came back and I started questioning things. I, 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 I was in a crisis of just like, damn, there's no one around me who's really inspiring me, especially in my field, in my area, in my realm, like martial arts, for, for example. And uh, a few months later, I think, or a couple of months later, we naturally connected up with Matt Thornton. I, 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 it led me, everything led me to a moment where I asked him if he could talk to me, and he did, and I'm very grateful for that ever since. And during that talk, after that hour, first of all, it was one of the best talks I ever had. If you haven't listened to that one, do. It's, it's called Questioning uh, Your Martial Art. Uh, but also at the same time, a few days later, I realized, there we go. <laughs> Finally, I found someone again who I can look up to. I was really impressed by Matt and on many levels. And the more I read about him, the more I, I looked into him. And then we had another talk with him about personal development and growth in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA. And I realized, wow, that's for sure another, that's for sure a person that, that inspires me to become more, to, to, that reminds me that there's more to search for, there's more to develop myself. And, uh, and also in, in, in very incredible ways. And those ways are, first of all, compared to my past uh, background, in Aikido, it was all about spirituality and, and very, very universe thoughts. It's, it's all about universe and there's the energy and there's just like all these grandeur things. And not that there's nothing good in them. There are... But at the same time, there was so much talk and sometimes lack of walk. A lot of times it was talking about, a lot of times it was talking about um, just like there were talks about how you should be and how the universe works and etc. But, but oftentimes it was just off. Not always it translated to everyday life. Sometimes one thing would be said and another thing would be done. And partly I think because the, 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 the theoretical part was just so high up that it's almost impossible to live up to that. Yet when I talked to Matt, especially about personal development, what I was really impressed with, despite years of experience, despite the, the fact that he's really up there, like he, he, he's, he's really so good at what he does and, and he expanded it in so many realms. It's not just about jujitsu for him. But, but he was 
he there's so many pearls of wisdom when he speaks for sure but it's also so simple and authentic and that's that's one of his part of teachings it's authenticity which he will talk about in this talk and uh, and and that i was i really admire that that there's no trying to there's no feeling of Matt Thornton trying to impress others with what he has to say. There's no trying to show something, say something cool. He just, some things he says are super profound, but they're, he's not pushing it. It's natural and it's simple. And and the, the example I'll give you, and then eventually I'll get you to the talk. I'll, I'll let you listen to the talk. I didn't expect this to go so long. I'm sorry. But the example I'll give you, I asked, uh, asked Coach Matt uh, about relationships like relationship crises. And in my past background, all these gurus and masters, they would start telling you tips and what to do and what not to do, what relationships are all about. And I kind of expected, I was like curious, okay, so what's Matt's, Matt's opinion about this? And then he, his answer was like, well, if, if my student asked him what if a student of, him, of his would have such a crisis, and he said, well, I would take that person out for, for a drink and I would just talk to him and kind of like be there for him. I'm like, uh, that's a good answer. There's nothing like there's no trying to convince that that there's superior knowledge there or something. And I'm sure Matt would have great advice, but but there was no trying to sh- to present himself as an, as an expert in that field, which in general I'm just so tired of. Everyone is a, an expert in all fields, especially the black belts and like you know the the martial arts that I experienced and. In any fields. I mean, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, I think it was a genuine, sincere story that I really wanted to share with you all. And uh, just to, 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 to explain to you one of the reasons why I was so much looking forward to come to SBG. I'm so happy to come here. Because uh, I found another person who I'm... I finally found, again, a person who I'm inspired by. And I found some others too. But Nat is definitely in one of those high places. And, and it's just so great to meet such a person live. To spend time around what he has created and around him and to just get to see okay so what else can i discover and kind of uh open up in myself what what else where else can i expand it's it's a great experience and and that's why i'm so excited to finally introduce you to this talk uh so yeah thank you for listening i'm surprised you sticked around to the end of my solo conversation with myself but i hope you see my point i hope you're inspired as i am and i wish you to enjoy this talk well first of all thank you very much for making this opportunity sure. happen and it's really great to be here finally to see you face to face yeah it's a bit surreal <laughs> for me uh so a few questions i wanted to ask and um, beginning with sbg and um, i have a strong impression of what it is myself uh, and why it's different from other places, but just so would, everybody would know, uh, could you say in your words what is what makes SBG different from other organizations wow. and gyms? SBG is really a, a coalition of like-minded coaches that came together not because they were banded around a one particular black belt um, or or for business reasons. They came together because they shared a certain values. Mm-hmm and ideas about how martial arts should be taught and that's what kind of connects everybody and that creates a bond a much stronger bond <clears throat> i think than uh, some of the other organizations and it also means that if you travel around and you, you you've mm-hmm. i think this is your only gym you've been to sbg correct so far, yeah. okay but if you go to ireland or other parts of the world canada or wherever you go you'll find a very similar community and I think that part's unique because, again, they're, they're a part of the organization because they believe in uh, the principles that we teach and what we stand for. Mm-hmm. I'll ask a specific question uh, soon enough about uh, the training, the teaching methodology, but you mentioned principles. Yeah. Uh, could you say a little bit about the principles? What... Uh, at first, it was really about truth, so just what works and what doesn't in martial arts and... Um, and authenticity, and then it, and then of course it became about bettering our epistemology and and uh, and uh, our training methods, mm-hmm. and all the coaches have, have a very scientific, engineering kind of mind, and and um, are always looking to improve and find better ways to do things, mm-hmm. and it's since evolved into 
you know, as the coaches have matured into creating a, their own tribes of, of healthy people that, you know, are of all ages and a place where kids and women and families can go and train as well as our top athletes. So mm. it's, it's evolved over the years, certainly, but it, it began with a search for truth, um, evolved into constantly changing our training methods and trying to improve on them mm. and eventually reach a point where it's really ultimately about community now. Mm. Nice. Well, the, I think it's the, the mo mo motto is the one by one tribe. Yeah. That's, that's which is kind of an organic yeah, saying that came up, which is mm. more or less how the organization evolved. I didn't start martial arts to create an organization. It just happened. Mm. Coaches would call me and ask me to come in and teach, and, mm. and we linked up that way. Nice. Well, I have a strong belief that one of the best, some of the best things that happen happen naturally, so that no wonder <laughs> it happened that way. Uh, you mentioned a few things about... Uh, again, the, the training methodology, and one of the reasons why I was so passionate to come here, there were many, but actually one of them was that the gym I was training in, it had a fairly good atmosphere. It, was, it wasn't a bad gym, but it was a lot, there was a lot of roughness, like there were zero women, mm -hmm. uh, and especially in both MMA or BJJ. Uh, so really rough, uh, very little explanations of techniques, a lot of rolling, but, mm -hmm. but also rough rolling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also come from a culture which is kind of macho based. Mm -hmm. And there's that belief, which I feel is still spread around in many places that there's no pain, no gain, mm -hmm. that you can, that, <laughs> well, uh, and just to say a few more words about that, that it, unless there's hardcore intensity and even sometimes up to the absurd level of trauma, that right. there has to be that, right. that uh, expertise cannot be reached. But just one thing I wanted to quickly address is that I already learned you have world-level winning athletes athletes here and Conor McGregor is under SBG flag. So right. just like, it, it's probably different than right. that. So could right. you uh, say? Well, that? you know, um, I don't want to sound too arrogant because when I started back in the late 80s and early 90s, actually all the way up through, through the 90s by and large, we trained way too hard. Mm. And the kind of training you're describing would be familiar to the very old school guys that have been with me for two decades or more and be unfamiliar to the people now. We evolved out of that not because we wanted to make more money or the gym got softer. We evolved out of that because we found we could create athletes faster and better mm -hmm. without doing that. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of it also is I, I think sometimes people don't realize it's very easy actually very easy for me to take a group of tough athletes, young men who are in their early 20s who are already tough, ma imagine a room full of American wrestlers or football players, mm -hmm. and train them in a couple years to be able to fight. Not, that's not too hard. <laughs> um, and what you're doing there is you're taking people who are already tough mm -hmm. and you're just making them tougher um, or giving them skills, mm -hmm. in which case they can, they can fight better. But to take people who who haven't come from that background, who might be middle-aged and, and spent most of their life behind a desk, or they're younger and have never been athletic. Mm -hmm. In other words, the people actually need martial arts. Mm -hmm. And to be able to make them so that they're tough, so that when somebody like that wrestler or somebody comes in off the street and trains with them, they wind up getting tapped out by those people. Mm -hmm. That's actually <laughs> harder to do. And the, uh, the irony is, when you create an environment that facilitates that, not only are you gonna have a gym that's filled with women and children and families, which is great, because mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm a family man and I want my, to train with my kids and my wife. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna have an a environment where I wouldn't feel comfortable bringing my wife or children. But beyond that, you also wind up creating a, uh, an atmosphere where the athletes can get better as well, because mm -hmm increased brain trauma, sparring harder, mm -hmm. all that does is mean the athletes wind up getting injured more often and being able to train less and um, being more susceptible to being knocked unconscious. I mean, you don't make yourself tougher by getting hit in the head over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, everything we know about brain damage and, and the science behind uh, uh, concussions, it's, it's just, there's a much smarter way to do it. And in terms of jujitsu, what we're doing is we're looking for solutions that allow somebody that's not as strong and not as large to beat somebody bigger and stronger and that makes them to do that by definition they have to be technically superior mm -hmm. and so 
you know, if, if you're rolling in jujitsu and you're escaping submissions because you're tough or you're fast or you're explosive, that'll get people up to like blue belt, purple belt level, maybe competitive, maybe. But beyond that, you hit a glass ceiling in this sport where those kind of gyms are never going to produce somebody that's going to be able to go to Los Angeles or, and compete in the Mundials or the Pan Ams at the highest level at a brown or black belt level. There's a technical skill set that's just completely beyond them because they haven't gotten to the point where the training has become about efficiency. And so jujitsu by definition has to be done intelligently if you want to eventually get really good at it. You know, as John Franco would say, you have, you have to care more about winning than you do, or I'm sorry, you have to care more about learning than you do winning in the gym. And uh, you know, if it was a kind of sport where you could bench press more and then that would manifest itself in your performance in, on the mat against somebody that's a belt level higher than you, to be honest with you, it would probably have bored me a long time ago. Mm. It's not that way. Mm. And you can be a monster and if you're going up against a really good black belt and, and you don't have any grappling, they're going to dominate you on the ground, even if they're physically smaller than you, especially in a grappling only match. And that's what makes what we do cool, mm. right? And so I think sometimes those guys, sounds like in the place you came from, just haven't been exposed to that mm -hmm. aspect of it. And hopefully eventually over time, like we did, mm -hmm. will evolve to a, a more mature, tougher environment. Because in the end, what, what winds up happening here is we produce people that are going to be tougher mm -hmm. than what they're producing in the end. So, but you always have to approach this intelligently, right? Yeah, it's something I really experienced here even during this week that I trained, uh, reflecting back from where I trained before, uh, knowing that the intensity is going to be very rough and, and just all out by the end, everyone is just wasted. Right. Uh, then, then I would sometimes I would not go to the class. Right. I was like, oh, I have like 70% energy. I don't even go. Right. And I would like to, but I just, right. and then I would end up skipping classes right. and then it would just fall apart. And here it's like even like cl some classes are just one hour. Yeah. Uh, but it just feels perfect, and I feel like, okay, I can hit one, and then there's another one after, so right. it really works out that way. Yeah, I mean, there's a place where we have in this gym, you know, a lot of competitive athletes, especially in jujitsu. Mm. There's a place for training hard and training until you're exhausted, mm. but there's never a place to training until you're injured. Mm. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. If you wind up getting injured in training, and then you have to take however many months off because of whatever, that, that's not going to accelerate your growth. Mm -hmm. So the number one job of our coaches here at the gym beyond just helping people get good is to make sure we have a place where everybody's safe. That's the most important thing. Everybody is safe and not getting injured uh, because that's completely counterproductive. Even if I wanted to only train professional athletes, my number one goal would be to have a place where they don't come in and get injured, right? Just logically. So it doesn't make sense to, to be training that way. It's just stupid. Uh, something that also was very great for me to experience here is that um, I think it's local level champions, like MMA champions, but, but still they're, they're yeah. top of their game. Yeah. Uh, they're training with amateurs together. Yeah. And uh, from the few talks I had with uh, Coach Rick, yeah. he said normally that doesn't happen. It's, it's, so it's so fascinating for me to realize that that idea that it has to be separated and that unless, unless they train separately, it's not going to work. It's just here it's denied. Right. So it's, it's possible yeah. to train for everyone together. Yeah. If it's a good class and it's taught the way it should be, which, you know, hopefully my coaches are following that here, I think, mm -hmm. um, everybody should be able to train together. <clears throat> when I travel and do seminars, one of the things I always try and explain to people who haven't had me in before is I, I, I don't teach, there's no, there's no such thing as an advanced curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I don't like doing seminars where, you know, I'll have black belts for two hours and then white or blue belts for two hours. I'm going to teach the same material. If anything, I, it's actually a bit simpler and we, we just spend more time working isolation rounds as, as, with the black belts, but the material is identical. Mm -hmm. And so in a good class, when people know how to drill with each other and, uh, and you're focused on fundamentals, you can have a room full of 10 black belts, five of which are getting ready for a competition, mm -hmm. 20 white belts and assorted blue and purple belts and brown belts. And everybody, male and female of all ages and weights can train together and get something out of that class mm -hmm. so that at the end of that class, they've learned a little bit about jujitsu and they've gotten better. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, then you have to go back and re-examine your epistemology because there's some problems with the way you're training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
this actually brings me to a question I was very eager to ask. Uh, I saw on your social media uh, a phrase you would use, uh, so I'll try to quote it right, uh, white belt techniques, black belt mentality. Uh -huh. Is that in some new approach that you're, you're like new uh -huh. way of, I mean, I'm sure it was there around, but new way of putting it or, or just could you just say a little bit more about it? Sure. You know, the, the first thing, when I first began teaching a long time ago, the, the thing that really set SBG apart was we were talking about aliveness, which you and I have talked a lot about. And that was, that, that was a message, the way I phrase it sometimes, may have come across at the time, especially um, rub people the wrong way, but I was really addressing the JKD community. Mm -hmm. And then as we've you know, progressed, and, and now we live in a world where there are gyms like my gym and the MMA gyms and jujitsu gyms, which there were not back then. We're really talking about a, a different thing. And my focus now, a lot of times when I go is on the curriculum itself, not so much the training method. And the curriculum itself for me is all about training fundamentals. And when I talk about fundamentals, I'm not talking about, when you talk about a functional martial art, whether we're talking about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Muay Thai or wrestling or boxing, there's no such thing as a beginning technique and advanced technique. You know, the wrestlers at the highest level in the world, when they go to the training camp at Colorado Springs, they're working the exact same material. Uh, someone, a peewee kid, like five or six years old in peewee wrestling camp is working mm. in terms of level changes and mm. takedowns and everything else. And so it is with all functional martial arts. So what I try and get across to people is, you know, what's going to make you good the fastest is focusing on fundamentals and then create an environment where people can then experiment with those fundamentals and come up with their own game, which each game is going to be very different from the other one. And that's kind of the SBG approach where we're not really teaching people to link a bunch of moves together or teaching a kind of style. I don't teach a leg lock style or a rubber guard style. It's not what we do. And what we teach here has nothing to do really with my own personal game. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do and the sweeps and submissions I'm good at in particular or not good at are irrelevant to the, to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. The curriculum is the fundamentals, which I think everybody needs to know how to do. And then you're more or less left alone to experiment, come up with different movements and those fundamentals are taught at the white belt level mm -hmm. so one of the jokes between some of the black belts and myself is you know the best jujitsu the, the jujitsu that we all get the most excited about at least in this organization the kind of thing i see from hickson or henry or some of the other great black belts out there is white belt jujitsu that's what we're interested in as soon as someone starts teaching some long chain of whatever it is 10 or 15 movements that may or may not apply to me or any particular given person it's just not what i'm into there's lots of black belts that like that kind of stuff but if you show me a detail hickson is a perfect example of this every time he teaches he'll show a detail on elbow knee escape or you know a headlock escape or something that you would learn in your first year that we all learned in our first year and that detail instantly makes a difference in your game because it's so important to me, that's the gold of jujitsu. So I've, I consider myself like a jujitsu archeologist and I'm kind of panning for that gold. And I would call that a black belt mentality applied to white belt movements because you'll see sometimes, I've watched this with Henry Akins, he'll have videos on YouTube and I'll watch it and I'll go, that's some great stuff, I really like it, or Hickson. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be comments, I almost never read video comments, but on the few, <laughs> the few occasions I have, I'll look and guys are like, oh, I learned that, you know, my first year or whatever and it's a purple right. belt or something and you realize they don't know what they don't know mm. they haven't trained long enough to realize the value of what he's showing in comparison to you know 10 more new moves and and so that would be what i'm referring to there being in the game long enough to actually understand what's valuable and what what's not which usually takes 10 to 12 years by the time you get about a black belt level mm. beginning black belt and then realizing that the best material is the stuff you learned the first 12 months of training and constantly going back and, and reworking that same material, which is really all I do for my own game. Would you say being obsessed about learning more and new techniques, especially those quote unquote advanced techniques, would, would you say that's a path astray, which blocks the person? It's more of learning? a phase. So, you know, in the beginning, if you're a white belt in jujitsu, you might be struggling and getting beaten by a peer and then the coach can show you a movement that'll allow you to escape 
or finish or whatever it is and instantly it makes a difference in your game and, and you start equating accumulation to performance which it is at that stage and this this is especially true around blue belt level where they're acquiring more movements and more attacks they, they have enough of the fundamentals to be able to play positionally but they get more movements and attacks and each time they get a movement it kind of gives them an edge on their other fellow blue belt and they really start to get into this accumulation phase. They go on YouTube and they start looking for all kinds of new stuff that the other guy doesn't know yet. Mm -hmm. But eventually, by the time you get around to, you know, brown belt level, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to beat the other brown belt, especially if you roll with them or her on a regular basis and it's not a one-off. You're not going to beat them because you catch them with something they haven't seen before. I mean, it can happen, but it's rare mm -hmm. because fundamentally, it, Positionally, they're going to be so good that you're going to have to pass their guard or, or be able to escape. You're going to have to be able to, to dominate in some way positionally to be able to finish them. And that's when you start to realize, oh, this is where I, you know, you can have two submissions in jiu-jitsu and, and be a threat to anyone. But you have to go back and, and rework the positional fundamentals that we, that we all learn at day one, you know, how you're, how you're shrimping and how you're moving your body, how you're connected to your opponent, your ability to, to feel their pressure, where you put your weight, um, all that stuff becomes so much more important than, than the new. But, it, you know, it, it often takes people years to figure that out. So <laughs> the benefit for my students here is if they're training with me or they're training with most of my coaches here, if they're training with Coach Kane or Rick, that's all they're going to learn anyway, right? So that's all we teach. So they're going to have to go on YouTube to find the other stuff. Mm -hmm. But when they come to class, it's going to be all about the fundamentals. Great. Uh, just a couple quick more sure. points. Great. So similar to, uh, to the direction we just talked about uh, in terms of beginners learning fundamentals, um, what would you say for a person who's just starting uh, jiu-jitsu or MMA, uh, is the smoothest or most efficient way of learning? Like what prevents a person from becoming better quicker than the opposite? What, presents, what prevents people from becoming quicker 99% of the time is their own ego and unwillingness to let go of things that might work in the short term, but it, as they progress will be bad habits. So um, you, you get somebody that can, you're working with someone else who's as good as you are or, or two beginners, mm -hmm. neither one of them is very good. Mm -hmm. And one of them is able to push or shove the other person off and it works. Mm -hmm. And then they go with Coach Chris, a brown belt, mm -hmm. and they go to shove him off and he arm locks them. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, if they go to apply that move, he's gonna arm lock them. Mm -hmm. And they'll never be able to play at brown belt level until they get over that habit. So Coach Chris will say, when you get here, you got to move your own body away from them with a frame instead of trying to push them off of you because if you go with me or someone that's much bigger and heavier, that's not going to work. And he'll tell them, right? Class. Then they'll, have, they'll be at a fork in the road. And the fork is, do you trust Coach Chris enough to believe that advice, plus it's logical, that you will actually try to work the correct technique even if it doesn't work instead of doing the bad habit next time you get in that position with that guy? Or is it more about just beating that guy that day? In which case you're still gonna push and shove him, especially if Coach Chris isn't looking. And then you'll have guys that'll be very big and strong and athletic, but will be blue belts for 10 years because they can't get over that. Mm -hmm. Wanting to learn jujitsu more than they, they care about wanting to beat their opponent. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes there's a, a short-term sacrifice in terms of what happens that day on the mat. Another, another classic example, when you have brand new people to jujitsu and they're working with someone they know is better than them, they'll avoid engaging. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with a black belt and I'm a blue belt mm -hmm. and we have a five minute round. Mm -hmm. I can stay on the outside of the guard and circle for four and a half minutes, mm -hmm. right? And, and then I can say, I, I was there for four and a half minutes and then jump in for 30 seconds, I get swept and go in, or I can go, man, I don't get very many chances to roll with a black belt. I'm gonna dive into that guard. I know I'm gonna get swept. I know I'm gonna get put in a triangle. I know I'm gonna get arm locked. But I also know that I have to get swept, put into a triangle and arm locked so many hundreds of times before my body will be able to have the timing to respond and stop it. So let's just get that over with now and rip the Band-Aid off and jump in and experience what it's like to engage with that person, right? 
It's totally different attitude. So on one, it's more concerned about how you're performing for that five minutes. And the other one's thinking long-term and saying, I got five minutes. I'd rather get swept and submitted by them three times in five minutes mm -hmm. than just hold out for five minutes and not get submitted at all. Because you can learn to do that against white belts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain intelligence there that, and that, that intelligence is the only thing I've ever seen in common. Like I've seen three or four people who've gone from pure white belt to competitive world-class black belt in about four or five years. I've seen it happen about three or four times. Um, I won't name names, but world-class competitors, right? In every case, the only thing they had in common, it wasn't, it wasn't they weren't great athletes per se. Um, they weren't, they didn't train 10 times more than a lot of other people do. They trained a lot, but a lot of people train a lot. The one thing they all had in common was that kind of innate curious intelligence that cared more about problem solving than it did that day's victory in practice. And long term, that lends itself to creating um, a world class competitor. Here on the, in the gym, if you watch um, John Diggins role, he's a very good example of this. He competes more than most of the other guys. And he's competed more than most of my black belts in terms of just pure competition. And he competes so much better than he often rolls in the gym, but it's not because he's performing better in competition. It's because he cares less about winning in the gym than he does just learning. So half the time he's experimenting, he's letting people do stuff, he's seeing how deep he can let, he can let something go before he counters it. He's, uh, he's playing and learning. Right? He's not just coming in and trying to crush the other person. And what that does is that lends itself to creating somebody who's technically a monster. So he, when he does go in and compete against um, Roberto Terra, whoever it is, he just, or Roberto Tellus, he had a very good match with Tellus, who's world class, right? Mm -hmm. He can hold his own and maybe win, mm -hmm. right? Even though he's, uh, he works full time and he's in his, mm -hmm. I don't want to age him, but I think he's in his late 30s, right? Yeah. In there somewhere. So he's not a young 22 year old that does nothing but train, mm -hmm. but he can hold his own and compete against those guys because he has that attitude in the gym. And plus beyond that, he's created, he is someone that everybody wants to roll with. And, and if I get injured or I'm coming back from surgery or I have somebody that it's their first day, I always know that they can roll with him and it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Right. He's somebody that everybody wants it, it trusts mm -hmm. to train. with. So, it's hard sometimes to get people to realize that training like John is the smarter way to go because we all, myself included, have competitive instinct where, you know, we want to go in there and sometimes you want to win. And that's, you need some of that too, for sure. You're not going to, you're probably not going to be motivated long enough to stay in this for 10 or 12 years. You've got to be somewhat competitive, but there's a balance there. And I think shifting that balance over more towards John's side of the, of the art is the answer to the question that I think you initially asked me if I yes. if I've stayed on target. Yes. So, yes. yeah, and actually it's it's interesting because you pretty much answered my next question naturally, the last one. Uh, uh, I would have asked what's the difference, what makes a difference between a good or great practitioner and excellent, like like just the next level. So, depends on what we're talking about. So, right. there's their own rolling game. And that's actually pretty, pretty easy to answer. Mm -hmm. But then in addition to that, you have ability to teach, which is often, well, completely unrelated, really, uh, often very unrelated ability to look at other competitors or uh, athletes and see what, where their strengths and weaknesses are, um, ability to communicate to other athletes, uh, in a corner during a fight or on the side of a mat, be able to articulate to them what they need in the appropriate time or motivate them between rounds. So there's all kinds of different skill sets that go into being doing what we do. Mm. And in the beginning, really what I try and foster here is once they get to brown and black belt is to also be able to teach the art to beginners mm. and understand how to teach the art, how to articulate it to other people so it goes beyond them. Mm. Because really what, what I'm trying to do is create people who are going to stay in this forever. Mm. And, you, you know, you're, most people are going to stop competing in their 50s <laughs> or somewhere there, right? Mm. But you can teach forever. You can roll forever in the sport. 
And then if they want to go and take it further into doing what, for example, John Cavanaugh does, John has an, an uncanny ability more than anybody I've ever met in my life, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. to look at somebody in jujitsu or MMA, a fighter or a, just a grappler. Mm -hmm. He can watch them roll in a competitive match for a couple minutes and be able to tell you how you break that game down and what they're going to be strong at and what they're going to be weak at. And that translates into him being such a good MMA coach, I think, because he can also apply that and use that to help his fighters, like exactly what they need to do. And, and yes, he's a world-class black belt when he rolls, but I'm not sure how much that has to do with, I mean, he needs that as well. That's mm -hmm. essential part. The fact that he can apply that game, of course, informs his ability to, to see those things. But I can roll okay, too. I'm not as good a, as he is, but I'm pretty good. But I don't have nowhere near the ability to look and break down people's games the way he does. So you have to respect each of those skill sets separately. And when you talk about somebody who truly is a world-class black belt, in my mind, I think of somebody who, who has a great personal game, of course, but also can teach all levels, can coach competitors, um, can motivate people, can teach a seminar, can teach one-on-one, -on -one, can, can look and see what you need to work and what you don't need to work, can, knows how to give out belts. There's a lot of black belts that have no idea how to give out belts, right? They just do it like by, they really don't know. It'll go by time. This guy's been here 15 years. He must be a brown belt, right? Mm -hmm. It's true. And then you'll see their lineage over time just gets watered down, but it's not because they're, they're trying to make the art worse. They just don't know what to do. They don't know how to really award the belts. So they're all kind of separate skills. And I try and, as, as my students are coming up through the belt ranks, try and explain that to them and try and help them work a little bit of each and then of course everybody's going to have strengths and weaknesses i'm not particularly gifted at being able to break people's games down the way john is so he obviously is very strong in that area other people are really good at you know teaching a large group of people or um you know other aspects of what we do so you wouldn't isolate uh like the the role of the person's ability to let's say roll on the mat or just compete as that point of excellence that sounds... No. I mean, some of the worst instructors I've seen in my life have been some of the world's best competitors. Mm. And they have no idea how to teach. Mm. You know, and I, I don't... I, I'm, of course, not going to name them, and I, I deeply respect mm -hmm. them, and they're, they're awesome. But when they teach, it's literally just like a step-by-step -step kind of rote explanation of exactly what they do when they right. roll which only apply, it's not going to apply to like 90% of the people in the room. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and then you have guys like Hickson, who when he wants to teach is a phenomenal teacher and can show details in a way that <clears throat> I don't know that anybody else can. Mm. And not everybody, you know, Hickson's world class, obviously probably the best ever in terms of rolling but he also has that additional skill of being able to teach it that, you know, not everybody shares that, so. And it may be connected as well, I guess. Well, it's definitely connected. It, it, there, it's, um, to use an, a political analogy, I mean, mm -hmm. you can't really have a free society without having some free, a free market system, mm. but you can have a society that has a free market system that doesn't have freedom of the press or uh, freedom in general, like you have in, for example, China. Mm. So you, call, you would say in that sense that that, that market-based system is a necessary but not sufficient component. So what I would say is being good at jujitsu physically yourself on the mat is a necessary component to being able to teach at a high level because you do need to, to have experienced that. Like there, there's certain aspects of, of just having done something yourself so many times that, that there's no other way to really trans transmit the information without that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, while necessary, it's not sufficient. And you can find people who are purple belts mm -hmm. who will be much better coaches than black belts because they can communicate better, they have a better sense of confidence, um, they, they have better interpersonal skills, they, they can break material down. Mm -hmm. So I think by the time you get to blue, high blue purple belt, is perfectly fine to start teaching a class, especially under the guidance of a black belt. And you'll find in that kind of environment, sometimes the best coaches aren't the black belts. Sometimes the best coaches are Coach Chris, who you're working with, right? Yeah. He's been a great coach 
long before he was a brown belt. He's been, a, he's been doing jiu-jitsu for a long time. He's been a brown belt for a while, but when he was a purple belt, he, he was one of my, the main coaches on my gym in the evening. And always phenomenal because he's articulates himself well, he's loud, he knows his material, he's confident. So you put him in front of a group class and you're gonna get good retention in a way that I can have other black belts that might be able to beat him on the mat, but they're never gonna be able to hold a class together the way he can. So again, to respect him as different skills.